So, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation to come to the Telegraph this time, especially to Andrew and Mark. Uh, so, the first talk, uh, as Mark said, is going to be probably the most technical of all, and I'm going to talk about my PhD and postdoc research on uh, automatic music transcription. Before doing that, just to put everything in context, I'm going to talk a bit about where I come from. So, the Centre for Digital Music at Queen Mary University of London. So it's um, a fairly large group formed in 2003. Uh, its sort of uh, main goal is to do world-leading research into digital technologies for understanding and innovation in music and audio. Um, C4DM, uh, as it's commonly known, has organized quite a few conferences over the years. Um, it's, uh, with respect to teaching, we now have a master's course for sound and music computing, as well as a PhD uh, center for doctoral training in music and arts technology. And you might have come across some of the software being uh, released by the group, uh, mostly such as uh, Sonic Visualizer, which is uh, a software framework for uh, visualizing and analyzing music recordings. Uh, this figure here shows sort of the uh, research areas that C4DM is covering at the moment. Uh, I'm based somewhere between the music informatics and the machine listening themes. Uh, but also there's quite a lot of research, uh, for example, in audio engineering, so sound recording, studio recording, augmented instruments, new musical instruments, uh, music and human interaction, uh, computational creativity, uh, generative systems for music, mathematical models, this is led, for example, by Elaine Chu on her work on mathematics and music, uh, performance science. And I think, as I was telling Andrew before, the only bit we're missing is actually on the music language bit, uh, symbolic music processing bit. Uh, on sort of funding, um, the main uh, programs that C4DM has at the moment is its platform grant, uh, its uh, Center for Doctoral uh, Training in uh, Media and Arts Technology, as well as its uh, program grant in uh, fusing audio and semantic technologies for intelligent music production and consumption. And these are a few of the sort of beneficiaries and uh, industry partners that uh, the group uh, is working with. So now moving on to the actual topic of the talk, uh, automatic music transcription. Uh, there have been quite a few definitions. Uh, the one I'm going to tell you is that it's defined as a process of converting an acoustic music signal into some form of musical notation. It could be human readable or machine readable, like a MIDI file. Uh, and in order to do that, we often have to go through some sort of intermediate process in order to understand, for example, which notes are present at which time in the audio recording, uh, for example, the indexes of the notes and the start and the end times, at least. And it is uh, a fundamental and still open problem in this uh, field of music information retrieval, or MIR in short. Uh, and has quite a few applications, uh, for example, for creating interactive music systems if you want to do automatic accompaniment. Uh, in computational musicology, uh, if you want to uh, come up with um, music musicological analysis of audio recordings. Also for indexing um, uh, sound collections, for retrieval similarity purposes, you need to come up with a symbolic representation first. And it can be divided into several subtasks. First and foremost uh, is pitch detection. So to detect the notes in the recording, or more correctly, multi-pitch detection, to detect multiple concurrent notes in an audio recording. Then onset and offset detection to detect the end and the starting point of each musical note, then to identify also the instrument that produces notes, and then to extract also rhythmic information, to identify dynamics or expressive uh, markers, and finally to put everything together, uh, to typeset or engrave all that information into uh, coming up with a human readable uh, staff notation. Uh, most of the research nowadays in uh, automatic music transcription is coming from the perspective of computer science and electronic engineering. Um, it involves usually uh, signal processing and machine learning methods in order to accomplish the tasks. So, for example, most of these techniques for transcription nowadays use uh, audio features, so coming up from the signal processing side of things, or methods from statistics and probability, 
I'm going to talk about uh, today about matrix decomposition methods, which are linked with both signal processing, mathematics, and machine learning in a way. And more recently, we've seen quite a few connectionist methods, so methods coming up from the uh, fields of machine learning that deals with neural networks. Uh, these transcription methods are annually evaluated at this uh, MIREX competition, um, which is held at the uh, ISMIR conference every year. And there are two tasks that are used to evaluate systems that do automatic transcription. The first task is this multiple at zero estimation task. So basically, it tries to estimate at each time frame which nodes are present in the recording. And then we have a more perceptually meaningful node tracking task, which tries to identify a node in a, on the recording with a start and an end. And there are quite a lot of open challenges still in this um, automatic music transcription topic. Uh, first and foremost is that the performance of these automated methods is still clearly below that of a human expert. Um, I would like to also note that a, a human expert uh, doing a sort of a, someone doing an automatic and music transcription is not is a non trivial task. So you need quite a few <coughs> training in order to uh, come up with a good transcription. And the performance of these systems is quite below, especially in the cases of multiple instrument music. So we have too many instruments playing at once and also in the cases of high polygamy, so we have too many notes played concurrently. Uh, another challenge is the fact that there's not quite a lot of data to actually do the task. It's really difficult to come up with annotated recordings for, where for each recording you have annotations for each specific note. Each recording might have hundreds or thousands of notes there. Uh, for example, when I was doing my PhD, in order to annotate a one minute recording, I think it might have taken me three days in order to do that. And there's also no unified methodology. So, for example, in a, a closely related task to automatic user transcription is ASR, automatic speech recognition. Uh, whereas in the ASR field, there's a sort of a standardized methodology in terms of the techniques that are used. For example, uh, you use uh, features called NFCCs or a classifier called uh, GMN or HMN and things like that. There's no such thing in the user transcription world. So we'll go on now to the uh, matrix factorization methods part. Um, so there was a paper in Nature in 1999 by Lien Tsung uh, proposing this uh, method of so-called non-negative matrix factorization. They came up with this algorithm which could decompose a matrix into a low rank decomposition, a non-negative matrix. Their main uh, focus at this time was image processing. What they were trying to do was that, assuming we had an input image, they would like to decompose this image as a sort of sum of local parts. Let's say that we have an image of a face, we'd like to uh, decompose that image in terms of one eye, another eye, a nose, a mouth, and so on. So we would come up with a dictionary of these elements of a face. When multiplied correctly, they would approximate the original face. That was the main motivation. And the big constraint in this method was the fact that the data is non-negative, and that means that this model is purely additive. So we just have the parts, we add them with some weights, and we come up with our solution. Over the years, this method uh, has been applied to quite a lot of tasks uh, over the data science field, uh, on detection, on uh, dimensional reduction, clustering, on classifying, denoising, and predicting, and many more. And this has been applied both to images, but also even to text to uh, video and also audio recordings. Uh, if we put a bit more math into it, the NMF model assumes uh, an input non-negative matrix V, and the goal is to approximate it as a product of two non-negative matrices, W and H. And the idea is that the rank of this factorization, so the R here, is small in order to compress the original input. And various algorithms have been proposed in order to do that, for example, using uh, expectation maximization from machine learning theory or gradient descent methods. And various uh, sort of cost functions have been proposed in order to come up with a solution how, for how to minimize the difference between the input and the output of this problem. But how about audio specifically? Uh, in 2003, uh, Smart, Desmond, Brown came with this idea that we could apply NMF 
to a spectrogram of an audio recording. So here in this figure you see uh, the spectrogram of a short piano segment which I'm about to play now. So basically a spectrogram, uh, to those not familiar with it, is a two-dimensional representation of frequency in the vertical axis and time in the horizontal axis. Um, and you can see clearly in the spectrum these horizontal lines which denote the fundamental frequency and the harmonics of each note present in the recording. And what Smart and uh, Brown found that when we apply an MF to this uh, spectrum here, we can come up with two sets of matrices. The one, very conveniently, has in each row a signature for each individual note present in the recording. This uh, particular recording has five notes which are sort of uh, represented here as a one-dimensional spectrum. And the other matrix, the H matrix, has as its output uh, activations for each of the notes in the left part. So it tells us when each note is active at which time point in the whole uh, version of the recording. So this is essentially kind of like a raw transcription. We can use that information in order to come up with a decision on which node is active at which time frame and come up with a proper stuff notation in the end. So at the, roughly at the same time in the field of uh, text mining, uh, Thomas Hoffman uh, came up with a technique which he called probabilistic latent semantic indexing, PLSI, which subsequently was taken over by the video people, which they renamed it as probabilistic latent semantic analysis, PLSA, which was further then uh, incorporated by the audio people into a technique called now probabilistic latent component analysis. In fact, what was uh, discovered a few years later was that this sort of PLSI method was essentially a probabilistic counterpart of this uh, NMF non-negative matrix factorization method, um, which, however, offered a framework, a Bayesian framework, that uh, made it easy to uh, combine and use other methods coming up from probabilistic machine learning theory and come up with more interesting models for decomposing uh, matrices. This is how this uh, PLCA model is formulated in the audio domain. If we assume an input audio spectrogram, so two-dimensional frequency and time, then this PLCA method approximates it as a bivariate probability distribution of uh, frequency and time which is in turn decomposed into two main matrices. One is a matrix probability of uh, a frequency given a component, in which case a component can be a musical note. And the other one is the activation probability, so which component is active at a given time frame. So this is the H matrix in the end. So essentially, this kind of model can decompose a spectrogram in a into a series of spectral bases. Each such a basis can correspond to a musical note and also to uh, event activation. So when is each node active, present, at a given time frame in the recording? And this basic model has been used in quite a few applications in the uh, fields of machine listening. For example, for multi-pitch detection, for detecting multi <coughs> notes, or for detecting generally acoustic events in everyday urban or nature sounds. Also for separating sources or separating musical instruments uh, in recordings. And another extension that was uh, proposed uh, a few years later was also on uh, convoluted models. So far the model I presented was linear. So it was a matrix that was decomposed into a product of two matrices. We can also come up with convoluted models and um, which try to extract shifted structures out of non-negative data. Why is that interesting? That is interesting for music because if you try to uh, visualize a music spe spectrum of a music recording into the log frequency domain instead of the linear frequency domain that is mostly used, then you can observe that pitch shifts, changes in the musical note, uh, can appear as vertical shifts of a common pattern. So here, the spectrum on the left uh, is um, a recording of a violin glissando, sorry, You see that basically everything rises a bit, and then it fluctuates, and then it drops again. If we apply one of these convoluted methods, we can come up with one sort of pattern which represents sort of the uh, harmonic signature of uh, that specific violin. 
And if we try to shift that vertically, that pattern, then we come up with this sort of distribution, which tells us that we have a node that goes up, fluctuates a bit, so there's a vibrato coming up, and then it drop, uh, drops down again. So we can actually use these convoluted models to come up with uh, methods that can detect tuning, can detect vibrati, tremoli, and uh, sort of uh, other types of frequency modulations uh, or microtonal sort of analysis in music. And now, uh, this is the part of uh, how these methods have been used in uh, my research on multiple instrument uh, music transcription. So the goal I have is basically to create a system that can be used for multiple instrument automatic music transcription in the sense that you don't know uh, exactly what instruments are present in your recording, you don't have specifics about it, so it's a blind system and can cope with that. And also the constraint I was having was I wanted to also express these frequency modulations or tuning changes through this uh, shift invariance property I was just telling you about. And I also wanted to incorporate some uh, knowledge about music acoustics in the sense that a musical note is not when it evolves over time and its uh, spectral signature changes. So for example, on the left figure here, you can see a, a spectrum of a piano note. I think it's a C1. As you might also hear, I'm going to play it again. The note evolves over time, it's not exactly the same. So in the beginning, there's a strike of a hammer, and the, the sound is much more noisy, let's say. And then it moves on, we come to this so-called steady state, where you can have hear a sort of a harmonic sound, and then we come to the decay state, where some of the harmonics decay faster than others. So we can represent the spectrum as a series of uh, one-dimensional spectra, and we try to come up with the rules that constrain this evolution from the attack to the sustain to the decay state of various musical instruments. So this is the diagram of the system. The idea is that it takes as input an audio recording, it computes a time frequency representation such as a spectrogram, which is then fed into this transcription model, which is based on matrix factorization methods and relies on a dictionary of pre extracted uh, note templates from various instruments uh, across their whole note range. I think this particular image here shows a small sort of collection of spectra for a piano from a note uh, A0 to C8. And then the output of that model is post-processed uh, into finally resulting in a MIDI file. And this is the uh, equation summing up the model, and this is the last equation of this talk, by the way. Um, the idea is, again, that we have as input a log frequency spectrogram, which is decomposed into as a, a series of various probability distributions. The big one here is a five-dimensional dictionary uh, of spectral templates for each note, for each instrument, for each tuning specifications, and for a specific sound state in the point of the evolution of the note. So it is in the attack of the sustained state. Then we have another probability distribution which denotes the tuning for a particular time instant for a particular note in the recording, and tuning with respect to 440 hertz uh, equal temper tuning, by the way. And then we have another probability which is the uh, contribution of each instrument <coughs> in order to produce a note at a specific time instant. And then there's another probability which is the main output of the model which is when is each note active at each time frame. So that's the main mod, uh, output of the multi pitch model. And then I finally observe a probability on at which time frame uh, each note, uh, where is the, what is the sound state. So basically in the model we have one input spectrogram, this is fixed, the dictionary is fixed, and we try to learn tuning, instruments, pitches, and sound states jointly. And this can be done using the uh, iterative expectation maximization algorithm, <coughs> and also by adding a few temporal constraints on the order of these sound states. In the end, uh, the run times uh, for the system are 1 to 2.5 real time uh, using a CPU based method. But because we're talking about matrices, uh, computations can be sped up considerably if we use GPUs, so it will come, come up with a uh, 0 point times uh, free real-time uh, speed. So that means essentially that if I have, uh, let's say, a one-minute recording, then I can uh, do that, I can 
come up with a transcription on the, on the third of that time. And this uh, particular method has been also evaluated uh, apart from various private data sets to this annual Marx competition, and in twice in two years it came up first in these evaluations. We can download the code for this method as well as for a few other methods from the URL video. Uh, and that includes also the code for the GPU based method as well. And a few examples of how well this method works. So on the, on the top figure here you see the so-called piano roll representation for a piano recording. So, I don't know if you heard, but basically the system is mostly able to detect the notes. It does miss a few notes, you can see from by comparing the two uh, here, the two figures here. But most of the sort of core uh, harmonic content is there. Some of the timings are a bit sort of wobbly, but not terribly so. Another interesting aspect of the system is that it can be used to do a bit more thorough uh, analysis of uh, of uh, high frequency content. So here is uh, the output of the transcription system for a uh, boat, uh, for a um, string uh, quartet recording. And you can see here that the system was able to detect all the vibrati caused by these uh, boat string instruments. And the uh, final thing to note is that uh, this uh, system is also available as a so-called VAMP plugin. So this is one of the plugins used in the Sonic Visualizer framework. And it can be used in order to do, for example, real-time uh, transcription or in order to uh, plug in with sort of other systems uh, for doing any sort of uh, real-time um, music technology applications. You can export uh, an audio recording into a MIDI file, for example, and things like that can be downloaded from the URL there and in uh, quite a few uh, operating systems, Linux, Mac, Mac, Windows, and so on. Now, moving on uh, to the uh, topic of music language models and how they can be used uh, to improve automatic transcription. Mostly, uh, uh, multi-pitch detection methods, uh, transcription methods so far, have been using only acoustic information, so information only from the audio recording. However, there is this hypothesis that uh, we can improve this uh, performance of these transcription systems if we also use prior knowledge from, uh, let's say, the language of music, however we might be able to define that. In a way, that's similar to how uh, speech recognition systems work. Typically, they consist of an acoustic model which tries to record an audio signal and also a spoken language model, so it tells us the probability that this word, this word is present given the previous context. And, but there was an obstacle for, there are quite a, quite a few obstacles right now for doing this sort of thing to music. And um, one obstacle is, of course, how do you define music language? It's not as well defined as, let's say, spoken language uh, given a specific context. Another obstacle is the fact that there are no uh, off-the-shelf methods for modeling and recording from music. So where is it? quite straightforward to uh, model a uh, spoken language in the sense that there are quite a lot of uh, models, for example, uh, engrams, Markov chains, Hino Markov models that can come up with a, a probability for a given word, given the previous word, things like that. There's no such thing uh, as straightforward for the case when we have unconstrained polyphony, where we don't know how many concurrent notes there exist in the recording. Um, up to recently, where uh, a few people like uh, Boulanger and Lewandowski came up with uh, uh, deep learning based methods uh, for modeling polyphonic music using recurrent neural networks. So one approach that uh, was done uh, also in in, when I was back at City University in collaboration with Queen Mary University of London was uh, to use one of these recurrent neural networks which, can, uh, which act as a, a music language model. And connect them with this uh, uh, PLCA-based uh, automatic music transcription model 
in a sense that we can use the music language model as prior information. Uh, what we found out that basically we did the transcription and then for, uh, we did a prediction step using the language model and then we fed that prediction back to the transcription step was that we found out there was a significant improvement in terms of transcription accuracy. So the system was, the music language model was able to correct a few of the mistakes made by the acoustic system. For example, semitone errors or uh, some random notes appearing out of context. And this uh, approach was further um, continued by replacing the acoustic model now with a deep recurrent neural network and also by coming up with a, a more principled way of merging the acoustic and the language information. Uh, and that was done, this diagram here essentially uh, tells you that uh, we had the observations from the acoustic model and we assume that these are generated by a music language model. And the language model is connected over time using a variable called the Markov chain. Uh, and that was uh, so this hybrid uh, acoustic uh, and uh, language scheme was able to also uh, come up with a significant improvement in terms of transcription accuracy. And the final approach uh, was uh, a bit more recent paper was that the acoustic model was replaced now by a deep convolutive neural network. The advantage of a convolutive neural network was the fact that we now could take into account the temporal context in the acoustic signal, so we could take into account the temporal evolution of a note and join that with the language information. And the results, the system was evaluated for uh, quite a few pieces of piano music and the results were really promising um, when we integrated the acoustic model with the language model. The final part of this talk is about applications now of transcription. Uh, so apart from the core application that I just presented, I have done a few collaborations. Uh, first one was with Andre Holzapfel, on, uh, who's a computational ethnomusicologist, on how we can use these methods to transcribe music that uh, sort of non-Western music. Um, we, so we came up with a system that was um, able to disregard this assumption of 12-tone uh, equal temperament and. Uh, uh, come up with a method that could trans transcribe microtonal music, and we apply that to the uh, Makam music uh, idiom of uh, Turkish, of Turkey. Uh, another application in the field of uh, computational musicology was also with uh, Tamun Vaig and Simon Dixon, uh, where we wanted to estimate temperament uh, in uh, harpsichord recordings. Um, so uh, temperament essentially is, uh, let's say, tuning configuration note by note. Uh, which can indicate mood and was quite a lot of uh, sort of uh, quite popular in early music although nowadays it's less and less uh, used and uh, using uh, automatic transcription of harpsichord recordings we were able to come up with a sort of high precision frequency estimation in order to come up with this exact temperament estimation for these harpsichord recordings Another application that uh, Tillman will uh, present later in more detail was the fact that these transcription-related features can be used to explore and visualize music collections. Uh, through this uh, Digital Music Lab system, uh, transcription-related features were able to be used uh, in order to estimate tuning for various music collections or to come up with sort of pitch class profiles to uh, come up with uh, which notes are prominent in uh, collections of recordings. Uh, a more recent paper that will be presented in a couple of weeks from now at the Izmir conference uh, was that, again, a collaboration with Andre Holzapfel on combining automatic music transcription with uh, beat tracking. So one of the drawbacks we had so far is that the system is able to produce a representation in terms of time of the transcription, but that representation was not directly convertible into uh, a staff notation. By using beat information, we're now able to quantize the detected notes on the system and come up with some sort of uh, uh, staff notation that can be interpreted by humans. And now we also come up with another interesting problem, which is about how to compare uh, an automatic staff notation with a manual uh, staff notation transcribed by an ethnomusicologist. So that's kind of like future work on how can we compare now staff notation. And the final application is that that goes beyond music and 
is directed to the other half of my research nowadays is that this transcription-based method um, was successfully poured into another uh, application area which was on sound event detection. So on creating systems that can recognize every type of environmental sounds. Um, you see here, for example, a spectrogram with uh, system outputs for detecting uh, various types of office sounds like speech, door knocks, um, door slams, and so on. So these kinds of matrix composition methods can go beyond music for, uh, and can also, this is also something that came up during lunch, is that uh, these uh, methods can be used um, also to come up with acoustic language models. So to come up with language models that are able to sort of detect uh, any repeated patterns in sort of everyday, everyday sounds. So to sum up, um, I hope I was able to convince you that uh, automatic music transcription is a sort of enabling technology in the field of music information retrieval, and that these matrix decomposition methods can lead to systems that are interpretable in the sense that we come up with clear outputs for tunings, instrument presence, notes being there, can also be extended, and also computationally efficient. There are quite a lot of emerging applications uh, of automatic transcription in fields of acoustics, such as instrumentation, measurement, also in performance science, music education, uh, so that transcription can be used, for example, in order to come up with systems for automated instrument tutoring. However, it's still like an open problem in the sense that uh, the result is not good enough as of yet, at least for uh, sort of an end user. And one of the reasons for that is that most of the work for automatic music transcription is coming up from the fields of signal processing and machine learning. And there's input needed from other disciplines, uh, such as music acoustics, also music perception, cognition, musicology, in order to come up with a sort of a, a fully functioning uh, user-facing music transcription system. As future directions, I would say, first of all, some work on input representations. So what is the input of your system? There is uh, quite a lot of work in the fields of psychoacoustics uh, on uh, representations derived by computational models of the human auditory system that can be investigated. Music language models, uh, I did present some work on that, but the field is far from being uh, sort of exhausted. There's so much work to be done in the area. Uh, no tracking over time is another problem that hasn't yet fully been addressed. So how to track multiple concurrent acoustic events over time. And then also how to adapt the systems to different conditions. Let's say that uh, you have a transcription system that might work well enough for studio recordings, but if you make a recording using your iPhone, is that good enough? If you make a recording using uh, and you're based in an open space, is it the same as being based in a room? No. So we need to adapt the system to different conditions. And also there's the fact that there's quite a lack of uh, sort of dissemination in terms of code and data uh, in the community and uh, we need to do something about that. Uh, these challenges and many more are also included in this uh, EU roadmap for music information research that was published a couple of years ago. And uh, thank you very much for listening and thanks to all these people uh, who I collaborated over the years and helped me with this work. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so you were talking about the field of transcription doesn't have really a, any unified theory mm. of where what's the best method to use, where's the best direction to go. Do you think that uh, these matrix factorization methods are that way to go, or are there drawbacks to it? Are there ways that other ones are better? Well, I'd say that maybe for now there are the majority of methods being used are based on these matrix factorization methods. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some drawbacks in the sense that uh, in order to incorporate the full extent of prior knowledge that we want to incorporate, you need to come up with really complex models. And it's not so. In, the problem with these methods is that you need to basically uh, you need a piece of paper and a lot of time to come up with a big equation like this to put all the knowledge you have in. That doesn't cover anything. Um, whereas um, sort of deep learning methods, it's more of a black box thing. Uh, you just hope 
that will work if you have quite a few layers and inputs. Um, in my opinion, these are promising in the sense that they cannot only be used for solving a specific problem, but can be used to uh, detect quite, to do quite a lot of things. For, for example, this one here can be used also for source separation. Uh, can also be used for detecting instruments. Can be used for deep browser detection and things like that. Uh, so uh, I think the transfer learning argument is quite significant in that respect for these types of methods. So would this model be better at doing, say, instrument detection than one that was a discriminant model that was just for instrument detection? So it's taking lots of things into account. So yeah. we thought it could be, it could be. So discriminative models, they're not really successful for detecting um, instruments in polyphonic music uh, because they use this sort of uh, bag of features approach. So we compute various types of features, you put them into some sort of classifier, and you hope that yeah, it will be good. Mm -hmm. um, I think in order to do proper what we call instrument assignment, so to detect every node, and for each detected node to assign it to a specific instrument, you need to go beyond simply discriminative methods and come up with some sort of joint source separation method that tries to separate the instruments and then to identify the instruments. Uh, I saw that some summations uh, uh, sum over the number of events or the number of instruments. Mm -hmm. What would you determine that? Yeah, so in this model, the uh, number of instruments is predetermined. We don't know how many instruments exist in the recording, but we do have a dictionary of, I think in this case, I had a model of 20 different instruments, which can be present in the recording, like piano, viola, violin, viola, cello, and so on and so on. Uh, the system is able to detect which instruments exist in the recording, but we do have a predefined set of trained instruments beforehand. And we also have a predefined set of possible notes so this model covers a set of 88 possible pitches, uh, semitone scale from A0 to C8. And, and in terms of the generalization, uh, because you are using templates, yep. um, you, you can generalize if you have some templates of certain piano, you can uh, use another signal from another piano or mm. yeah. another channel. So that one of the interesting things about this model is this probability here, which tells you the probability of an instrument being present given a note at a given time frame. That essentially tells us that we can approximate, we have a new note coming up from an unknown instrument and we can approximate it as a sort of linear combination of notes from our dictionary. So we can approximate a new piano by adding different pianos we have from our dictionary. So, um, in the transcription you're doing, you're, you're not using any sort of overall structural features like a time signature, a running time signature. And no. do, you, do you think that that would help you, in particular with the problem of notes dropping out? Because one of the things that we know about human musical understanding is that events that are very predictable in terms of decodable frames uh, they tend to be reduced. And I <coughs> anticipate that some of your difficulties with uh, notes dropping out might be helped by that. Do you think there's anything to that? Absolutely. Uh, there is one difficulty in coming up with a model that can incorporate time signature. But there's also the problem that uh, in sort of uh, real life audio recordings, the recordings are not that clean. So. Whereas the, the intention of a performer might be to come up with an exact time signature, maybe the resulting audio recording is not, doesn't follow that time signature very rigidly. Or that there's also right. reverberation, echo, and all things that sort of uh, smear out there. So, um, one of the cool things it seemed about the NMF method is that it can sort of if you're, as you're doing the factorization, you can almost come up with, you know, your own dictionary. So, um, is that something that you think could be done almost in real time as you're listening to a recording without the pre-trained dictionary? 
and are there more difficulties there? Mm. There are quite a, a few systems that try to do that. Yeah. Uh, but there's a difficulty in the sense that these models are too rich, essentially, and you need to come up with quite a lot of constraints in order to make them work. Mm -hmm. So in order to, to learn the dictionary just from the recording itself, you need to specify that each element in your dictionary needs to be harmonic, for example, and that the, the envelope of these harmonics needs to be smooth, but then you get into, you bump into exceptions. So for example, that the envelope of a clarinet is not really smooth, for example. Or that the um, templates for a piano recording, uh, for a piano, are not actually harmonic, because the piano is in harmonic. So you need to incorporate all these various rules, and then it gets complicated. Right. Uh, is there room for um, using the spatialization of instruments and stereo recordings to further isolate Absolutely. This is completely unexplored at the moment. I'm not aware of a single system that, drive, uh, that sort of exploits stereo information or special information. So there's quite a lot of room for research in that. Okay. Well, Thanks very much. Thank you very much.